All right, you guys, welcome to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. For those of you that this is your first time, welcome. And for the rest of you guys, welcome back. In today's lesson, we're going to be talking about the progression of respiratory support that we want to provide for our patients with COVID-19. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson, and this is ICU Advantage. All right, so let's talk about this, this progression that we go through in terms of respiratory support that we provide for these patients. Now, the exact pathway for treatment of COVID-19 patients still is not really completely known. We have our normal progression that we we're used to for increasing respiratory support, uh, along with months of learned experiences, all beginning in China, uh, then what we saw in Europe, and then now really what we've learned here in the United States and, and ultimately around the world. And there is no tried and true method on how we're going to support these patients, but we do have some ideas of things that seem to work and things that do help these patients. Now, what we do know is that COVID-19 can progress rapidly in these patients from the time that they present to the hospital. And like any treatment that we want to provide to anybody, we really want to attempt to utilize less treatment if we can. Now, we have seen the outcomes of patients who are intubated and ultimately on invasive mechanical ventilation, and they really aren't great. And while we don't know for certain whether this is a causal relationship, what we do know is we want to avoid this for our patients as the outcome just isn't good once they reach that point. And so our goal is to increasingly provide support for them, improving our patient's oxygenation and their work of breathing. And so to help us do that, we have a basic schema for respiratory support in these patients. And this was really outlined really wonderfully by EMCRIT. So I'm actually going to link to them down below. They're a really great resource, especially for a lot of things COVID related. But the basic progression here for the support goes like this. The first step is going to be our low flow nasal cannula or just the nasal cannula as we normally call it. The next step here is going to be utilizing high flow nasal cannula or possibly CPAP. Next is going to be our awake prone positioning, and this is going to be in addition to high flow nasal cannula and CPAP. The next step after this is the invasive mechanical ventilation. Then we come to prone ventilation. And then finally, our last option is going to be something like VV ECMO. And basically, we can think of these as steps to go through this progression through these different types of res respiratory support, both in the case where we're declining as well as going in the opposite direction in the case where our patients are improving or beginning to recover. And so what I want to do is I want to go through each one of these and actually talk about each one a little bit more in depth. So first we'll talk about the low flow nasal cannula. So this is our typical nasal cannula that we're used to seeing, the one that goes from 1 to 6 liters per minute. Now, we know that room air consists of 21% oxygen, and with each liter of flow that we have on this nasal cannula, it adds about 4% more oxygen. So we can really think of going from 1 liter to 6 liter as giving us a range of 24 to 45%. Now, the beauty of this is it's simple, it's easily available option that is really well tolerated by most patients. The big downside to this is that the oxygen delivery is going to be directly impacted by our patient's work of breathing. And so what do I mean by this? So if they start becoming distressed and they become tachypneic, then the concentration of oxygen that's going to be delivered to them is actually going to be decreased. And to help you understand this, the reason for this is we have a maximum amount of oxygen being delivered of 45% at a rate of 6 liters per minute. Now, if we have our patient who, let's say they're taking 500 milliliters with each breath, and they're getting tachypneic, let's say they're 30 breaths per minute, we're looking at 15 liters of minute ventilation that that patient's taking at that time. Yet, we're only providing 6 liters via the nasal cannula. And so what's happening is that we're actually going to dilute that 6 liters that we thought we were giving them 45% oxygen, but our patient is now breathing in uh, in excess of 9 liters or a minute, and they're only getting room air at this point, 21% oxygen. So we can see how at that point we're no longer delivering 45% oxygen, and they're actually getting something much less. And that's exactly why the nasal cannula can really only get us so far with patients in respiratory distress. And so when we reach that point, this is when the big guns come in. And this is where we want to reach for something like high-flow nasal cannula. Now, you might also hear this referred to as high-flow nasal oxygen. But essentially what this is, is this consists of a lightweight cannula that's capable of really delivering high volumes of oxygen concentration to our patient. 
And so the way it works is the oxygen is connected from the wall and it's delivered through a blender in which we can set the concentration or the FiO2 that we want to deliver to our patients in upwards of 100%. From there, it goes to the humidifier heater, which can not only warm the air to upwards of 37 degrees Celsius, but it also adds humidity. And both of these improve comfort for the patient and really help to prevent nosebleeds. The big benefits of this is it's going to decrease that airway inflammation, uh, as well as maintaining the mucociliary function, which improves the mucus clearance in these patients. And it really helps to reduce that caloric expenditure that the body would normally have to take to warm up the air. This part is also the part that's capable of creating the high flow that we see with this device, and we can really see flows ranging from 30 liters per minute up to 50 to 60, really depending on which device you use. So as you can see with the high flow nasal cannula, you can deliver a lot more flow with a lot higher oxygen concentration. And so imagine that same patient that we were talking about that's breathing 15 liters a minute. When they're in respiratory distress, they can have a peak inspiratory flow uh, really as high as 120 liters per minute. And so even in these really extreme circumstances of a, a really quick peak inspiratory flow, we can still be delivering 50 to 60 liters per minute at upwards of 100% FiO2. And this is ultimately going to lead to delivering higher levels of oxygen to these patients. And it's going to better match their minute ventilation, where again, in that previous example, we're looking at 15 liters of minute ventilation, which we can easily provide that with this device. And so we want to be titrating the FiO2 as well as the flow based on the needs of our patient. Now, if we do reach the point to where in these COVID-19 patients, we're giving them 80% FiO2 through a high flow nasal cannula, then we really want to consider either trialing CPAP or doing something like awake proning. Now, one really important question is going to be about whether high flow nasal cannula is actually an aerosolizing procedure. And to be honest, we don't have a good answer on this. ANZIX recommends airborne precautions when using high flow. The World Health Organization states that if you're using a well-fitted high flow or even non-invasive device, that it's really not going to create widespread dispersion of that exhaled air and thus poses a low risk for airborne transmission. Now, when a patient coughs, they can actually expel air at upwards of 400 liters per minute. So just logically thinking about it, it's probably unlikely that 60 liters per minute would be any more risk than someone who has a normal nasal cannula on that's coughing. But that said, I think erring on the side of caution, especially in these unprecedented times where we have a new pathogen, it's probably a good idea. Now, the other option at this point, instead of high-flow nasal cannula, would be the option of CPAP for our patients. And this can also include BiPAP. Now, I'm really not going to go into depth on this here because I have an entire lesson dedicated just to these two, which I'm going to link to right here for you guys if you haven't watched that one. But what we're seeing is it appears that COVID-19 causes this progressive microatelectasis. And so, as a result, we've seen patients respond quite well to CPAP. You see, CPAP increases our mean airway pressure. And because of this, it helps to recruit collapsed alveoli and really helps to prevent that atelectasis. Now, in the case of COVID-19, we want to be using higher pressures. So 16 to 18 centimeters of water if the patient tolerates it. And then from there, we just want to titrate the FiO2 to oxygen saturation. And a good thing to keep an eye on is a falling FiO2 requirement really indicates that we're getting that recruitment of alveoli. Now, you may want to consider using BiPAP, and this is going to be for those patients who have other lung conditions such as COPD in the presence of COVID-19. But we really want to consider using a higher EPAP with a low driving pressure. And so an example of this would be having an IPAP of, let's say, 16 but an EPAP of 12. This way you get the benefit of those higher pressures while still providing some ventilation support, but without the risk of potentially providing too much support and then ultimately causing lung damage. Another good option if you have them available would be the, the CPAP helmets, or, or really can be a good choice here. And then with this, we wanna make sure though we're using a viral filter. Now, important to know, though, that when we're using CPAP or BiPAP, that this is considered aerosolizing. And so we want to make sure that we're taking all the precautions when we're interacting with these patients on these therapies. And this is either going to be having the door closed or ideally in a negative pressure room if it's available. And this is where the CPAP helmet has an obvious advantage here with having that closed circuit and the viral filter.
So now at this point, if we're using the high flow nasal cannula or we're using CPAP or BiPAP and it's just not enough, then this is when we want to consider adding the awake prone positioning. So again, here, I'm really not going to go into depth talking about this as I do have another lesson. Again, I'm going to link to it right here that's dedicated specifically to talking about proning, why we do it, what the benefits are. So if you haven't watched that, I, I highly suggest you watch it. And I discuss these things in detail in that video, but many of the benefits that we see are from improving aeration of the lung tissue, improving that ventilation perfusion matching, as well as improving secretion clearance. And we really see great improvements when we're proning ventilated patients, and we're also seeing positive benefits in our awake patients trying to avoid intubation. And so awake proning can and should be used with respiratory support devices. So whether that's just our low flow nasal cannula, or in the case where we've progressed to this point, high flow nasal cannula or CPAP BiPAP at the same time. And ideally, we want to be doing this for 12 to 18 hours a day, but this can be difficult with awake patients. And really, the, the gist of the awake prone positioning is it involves having our awake patient prone themselves over to where they're lying on their stomach. If they don't tolerate being on their stomach, you can also see benefits just to having them on their side position. Uh, but obviously, this requires having a cooperative patient and one who really has an appropriate mentation. So now at this point, if we've tried all this and it's still not enough for our patient, then we're looking to move into invasive mechanical ventilation. And for this section here, this is just going to be a very quick overview of some of the strategies because this really deserves its own lesson, its own full lesson to, to really hit on this topic. But as I mentioned earlier, we obviously want to try to avoid getting here because the outcomes are not great for patients who get to this point. On top of that, healthcare providers are also presented with high exposure risk from the intubation process. So again, if we can prevent getting here with some of these other therapies, then that's really going to be desired. And so you might be wondering, what are the indications for progressing to this point? And ultimately, we're going to be using clinical judgment based on three things. Oxygenation, respiratory distress and work of breathing, and clinical trajectory. Now, when it comes to our oxygenation goals, this isn't really well defined, but probably if we're having difficulty maintaining SATs greater than 80%, that this could indicate a need for it. Now, when we talk about respiratory distress, it's important that we distinguish the difference between tachypnea and actual respiratory distress. Now, we can have tachypnea without distress, and this can actually be tolerated by patients as long as we're providing enough oxygen and enough flow to meet their demands. But if we begin to see an increased work of breathing, so this is where we see the accessory muscles being used, they have that air hunger, diaphoresis, again, this could be our indication that we might need to move to intubation. And then finally for the clinical trajectory, and this is really are we stable or improving or are we progressively declining? Now, once we reach that point, we make the decision, we intubate the patient and put them on the mechanical ventilation, then it seems like much of the thought of the medical community is we want to treat this as ARDS ventilation or have the same strategy we do for ARDS. And so this means our conventional low tidal volumes or using APRV. Now, while not a lesson on ARDS specifically, I I do have a series of lessons going over both our conventional as well as some of our more advanced ventilator modes like APRV. So I'm going to link to that entire respiratory system playlist here in case you guys want to check that out. But another thing we want to be looking to do is perhaps allowing a permissive hypercapnia. And maintaining a, a pH that's at or above 7.15, that this may be tolerated by our patient. Instead of chasing the numbers and focusing on the respiratory component of altering our patient's pH, we really want to optimize the, the metabolic acid-based imbalance that's going on. And so it's really common to see our ICU patients and our COVID ICU patients with this non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. And in these patients, an IV infusion of bicarb may benefit improving their pH without having to really increase the intensity of the mechanical ventilation setting. And so the last point that I want to make here is we might want to consider the use of the inhaled pulmonary vasodilators. And so this is going to be our EPO and our inhaled nitric oxide. So that was a really quick overview of some of the strategies for 
our patients once we reach this point, but just intubating them and putting them on mechanical ventilation might not be enough. And so this is where we may want to make the transition to prone positioning. Now again, see the reference lesson that I, I mentioned to, to really go in depth on this, but this can be really effective in improving oxygenation after our ventilator optimization has really failed. This does come with added risk, though, because it often requires a deeper sedation and sometimes the use of paralytics if needed. But not every patient requires this, and truly the, the benefit that we see in proning these patients absolutely leads us to doing this if we reach this point. And then finally, the, the last step, if all of this has failed, is potentially VV ECMO. And so ECMO is our extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And this is specifically talking about our veno-veno, so vein-to-vein -vein versus veno-arterial. VV ECMO is the ECMO that provides support for our patient's lungs. We essentially completely take over the work of the lungs. We essentially pull our patient's blood out through the use of really large cannulas. We send that blood to an oxygenator where, if you haven't figured it out, it gets oxygenated and gets returned back to the patient before their heart. It's a, an amazing therapy that, that we can offer to the sickest patients that we have. But right now, the indications for and even really the potential benefit of VV ECMO in these patients is, is not clear. There was early data out of China that was showing no real benefit to patients who received either ECMO versus prone therapy. So again, I think we're, we're far too early in this, far too early in our understanding and our optimization of really how to treat these patients to know if ECMO can buy us the time we need with other strategies that ultimately decrease mortality in these patients. All right, so I hope that was a good overview for you guys. Like I said, this is a progression of respiratory support that we can provide, starting with the least amount of support going all the way up to full complete support with VV ECMO, as well as stepping back in the opposite direction at whatever point we reach, depending on, you know, on if our patients are doing better and how they're beginning to progress and recover. Now, again, this wasn't a, a very in-depth discussion into each one of these. If you want that, go to some of the linked videos on, on some of the subjects where I already covered, uh, as well as I will cover a couple of these in more in-depth at a future lesson. But overall, I, I hope this gave you guys a, a good picture of the process that we want to go through in providing support for these COVID patients. I really hope that you guys enjoyed the lesson, that you guys found it beneficial. Uh, if you did, go down below, hit the like button, leave me a comment, let me know what you thought. I really enjoy reading and responding to, to all of the comments, uh, as well as make sure and subscribe if you haven't already subscribed to the channel. A special shout out and thank you to our awesome Patreon subscribers. The support that you guys provide really go a long way in helping this channel. Uh, on top of that, you get to receive additional content that you don't find just here on YouTube. If you'd be interested in, in showing extra support, head on over to the Patreon page, which I'll go ahead and link to here as well for you guys. All right. Well, with that said, thank you guys so much for watching. You guys have a wonderful day.